Hey, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. We pray this message and resource will stir up your affections for Jesus and encourage you in your calling. Use this resource in conjunction with you belonging to a local church that is helping to shape and shepherd you in Jesus Christ. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at Agape? You can visit us at agapekman.ky slash giving to see how you can do that. Again, we pray this blesses, encourages, and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. So why don't we dive into the message this morning and as we look at the Word of God today. Uh, first of all, I want to just say that I would appreciate your prayers today as we navigate through today's scripture. We have been in, in the book of 1 Peter. We're actually going straight through the book of 1 Peter, every single chapter, every single verse. And that includes some very uh, controversial and difficult scripture to navigate, and we have hit those this morning, amen? And, uh, and so I appreciate your prayers as we navigate some, some really troubled waters, particularly in regards to some of the things that are happening in our community right now. But you know what? That's part of the reason why we're moving through First Peter. As I was praying, uh, one of the things I always do when, I, when I'm doing messages or sermons or series is I always come to before the Lord in prayer first and say, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? And so... Given everything that's been happening, one of the things that, that I, I wanted to be sure that I was addressing and that I, that I felt the Lord putting strongly on my heart was that we as a church be prepared for the world that we're living in. And that's kind of what First Peter is about is about living in this world while not being of this world and navigating those different dynamics. And so this morning... Uh, there may be a couple of points uh, where I, I just, what I'm going to ask you to do is just bear with me through the whole message this morning, all right? Uh, there, there's going to be a few points that are going to be some, some issues that maybe you thought about them, maybe you didn't think about them, but this message needs to be heard in its entirety, not just a piece of it, you miss a piece of it, and, uh, and you may end up with a very different opinion. So we're going to move through the word, and so I just believe that as we move through it this morning, we're going to let God's word speak for itself. And let's just dive right in today because I've got a lot to say and not a lot of time to say it in. So let's get moving. I'm going to talk fast, so you're going to have to listen fast this morning, all right? So 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we're at. We're going to read from verse 13 down to verse 17 today, and then we're going to break it down. And so some of this, you're going to hear it, and we're going to go, oh, really? Praise God. So... Let's start reading verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. You ever wonder what the will of God is for your life? The Bible tells us over and over and over again. And here is what the will of God is for your life, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, this is a tough passage of Scripture, especially given some of what we're dealing with right now in our own community, right? Right? But my title today for this message is Jesus and Justice. We've talked about a lot of different things, and we're going to talk about a lot of different things as we continue to move through this. But, but today we're talking about Jesus and Justice, and it's probably one of the more controversial sermons that, that I will probably preach 
uh, and that I have preached in the time of being a pastor. Not that I necessarily expect you to disagree with me, but just the topic itself is about some things that are really kind of uh, hot button issues in our world today. And so as we navigate this, Peter starts talking, and the thing that Peter says to us as he begins here is that we have a perfect God who works through imperfect authority. We have a perfect God who works through imperfect authority. That God has set up human institutions. He's set up people. He has put people in place, governors, emperors. The, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And so what he's saying here is that, that God is able to work through us, through our lives as individuals, through the human institutions that have been set up and established, but it is done through imperfect authority, through a perfect God. And one of the things that, that, that as we deal with today's issue, uh, as I oftentimes talk to people who, who, as we talk about the Bible and we talk about various social issues that have come up over the years and so forth, and, and when they look at the first century church and, and the first couple of hundred years of the church, people have, have asked me the question before, they said, well, you know, why didn't the church just get all up in arms and start a rebellion, start a war, and overthrow the Roman Empire? Why didn't the church just declare war on them? And there's a few reasons for this. Uh, first of all, the church was very small at this period of time in comparison to the rest of the world. Remember, the Roman Empire still to this day was the largest, the most powerful empire in the history of the world. There has been no empire that has covered as much land as the Roman Empire. And they had a massive military in order to be able to control all these areas. The other thing is that the church had no legal rights in this day and age. In, in this time, in this period, in the Roman Empire, the church would have had no rights at all, or very little. In the Roman Empire, being the largest, most powerful nation in history, uh, the, the only way that I can kind of bring it modernized for us would be to compare it to a country like North Korea. It, it, it was that kind of nation where you worship the emperor as God. There was no, we talked today about the separation of church and state. There, there was no separation of church and state. The state and the church were together because the emperor was your God. You were to worship him. And so that's one of the reasons why at, at Jesus' crucifixion where they say, we have no king but Caesar, it's such a, a, an incredible statement in, in terms of, of that the fact that they are declaring that their God basically is Caesar and not the Lord their God. Not, not Yahweh, not Jesus, not the God that they've spent all this time serving, but that Caesar is their God is basically what they're saying when they say this. And so what was happening was that the, the people during this time, they would have been brainwashed. Uh, they, they would have uh, ultimately had very little rights. We talk about human rights a lot, in, in particularly in our time. And... Uh, if you were to say that Jesus is Lord and not the emperor, chances are you would have been injured, hurt, or killed in some capacity, and it wouldn't have just been you. Particularly if you were a man, they would take your family and they would do things to your family that no one would ever want done, to even to their worst enemy. They would do terrible things to you and to your family. And this is the context in which Peter is writing to them. This is the context in which Peter is telling them Honor the governor, honor the emperor. God has established these things. And you see, the freedom that you and I get to experience today, the freedom that we have to be in a building like this gathered where we're worshiping the Lord and, and we're free of, of persecution and threat of, of possibly dying every single time that we get together as a church to worship the Lord, this would be unimaginable to the writer, uh, to the people that Peter is writing to in this time and in this day. They could not run away, and they could not change the state. And because there was such a small group of them, and they could not do these things, they were facing a persecution that was continuously 
rising. So think of, uh, again, to bring it into sort of modern day context, think of Christians in China where they have to meet uh, in secret where they're hiding because they, they just don't know at any moment the government could come and burn the building down with people inside. Think of, think of you know, uh, Muslim areas where there, there's hardcore Muslim areas where, where they're killing Christians and, and they're doing all kinds of horrible and wicked things to them. This is the kind of threat and persecution that Peter is writing to these people and talking to them about what they are facing. So, so things aren't so good for them. Their political leaders are, are horrible. They, they've got worse political leaders than, than I, I would say almost, almost any political leader on the planet. Almost. I mean, we've got some, some, some terrible news here for this church, and Peter is telling them, honor the emperor. Now, the emperor during this time was uh, a guy by the name of Claudius. But next in line, next up, within short order, another guy would be coming along, and uh, his name was Nero. Nero put the church through some of the worst persecution that the church had ever faced in its life. Nero was such a terrible person, he would take Christians and tie ropes up to each of their four limbs, tie the other end to a horse, and have them go and run in different directions in order to dismember people. I mean, that's how horrible it was. They would have parties. Imagine a government-issued party, a state party, and you show up, and there you've got people tied around posts, and you use them for candles, alive. That's what they did to Christians. I mean, horrible, horrible, horrific things. They would take Christians and they would put them in the gladiatorial arena and just let animals just rip them apart. I mean, terrible stuff. And Peter still says, honor the emperor. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll be honest, reading that and knowing historically what happened to the church, you almost feel like, Peter, did you lose your mind? Then he goes on and he says, honor governors. Well, governors like who? Like Pilate? Who abused Jesus under his authority? Governors like who? Felix, who, who abused Paul? So which one of these governors exactly are we talking about is, is so wonderful? As we, we look historically at the church, we see a bunch of people who had no regard for the people of God, who, who cared nothing about their life. As a matter of fact, the only thing they saw us was as entertainment and something to be killed. And Peter says, honor the emperor and governors. Then he says, honor human institutions. Now, now here's the thing about this, right? He says, maybe you just talked about this. Children, obey your parents. Children, honor your your father and your mother. Children, we we have a father who we need to honor. And there is a, uh, a, a human institution of parenthood that God has put in place where we are to honor the Lord and children are to honor their fathers and their mothers and then we talk about citizens that as citizens we are to have a modicum of respect for our political leaders in the church as Christians we are to have respect for and honor our pastors and those in oversight and in governance positions that at work you're supposed to honor your boss and respect your boss that as a citizen that we should respect and honor first responders, our, our officers who protect the rule of law. We don't have a real military here in Cayman, but, but if we had a military that protected our, our rights and our freedoms, that we should honor them regardless of how we feel about them, our political leaders who frame the way that we live. Here's what Peter's saying. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to even like them. You don't have to like the things that they do, the things that they say. But he says there is an element of respect that as Christians we must give to everyone. This is controversial, I know. But the Bible isn't an old book. It's a timeless book. It's not a book that was just for 2,000 years ago. It's a book for today. I mean, doesn't some of this sound kind of familiar to the things that we're facing today? No, we mightn't be being dismembered and used as candles, but, but you can see how this is relevant to the time that we are 
living in today. Peter says to honor, to show some element of respect to because God is ultimately the one who is in charge. Now, let me ask you two questions. And the first question is this. Who are you in authority under? Who are you in authority under? And how are you responding and respecting that authority? And the second one is this. Who are you in authority over? Who are you in authority over? And of the people that you are in authority over, would they say that you are honorable, that you are gracious, that, that the character of Christ is shining through in your life? Would they say that about you? Because here's what the problem usually is, right? Here's the hypocritical nature of this, is that when we are in authority, we want everybody to respect authority. But when we are under authority, we've got all kinds of reasons as to why we don't need to. So when we're in authority, everybody listen to me, listen, I'm just trying to do my best. I'm just trying to help everybody. I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to, and, and then when we're under authority, we go, I, I don't have to listen to that. I don't like that. I don't like you. I, I don't have to, to follow that. And this is a part of the human condition because sin has entered into the world. And as a result of sin entering into the world, we see these various issues and problems arising. And so because of this, Peter issues seven very specific commands to the church. And so let's look at these very specific commands that have been taken here from the scripture. And so the first thing he tells us to do is he says, do good so that you can silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now, is there still ignorance in our day and age? I mean, it's 2020, the Bible was compiled to some 2,000 years ago, and there is still ignorance and foolish people in our day and age, isn't there? And here's the thing. Do ignorant and foolish people tend to be quiet or loud? Loud. loud. As they used to say when we were growing up, empty barrels make the most noise. But here's the thing. If you fight with ignorant and foolish people, do they get quieter? No, they don't. They only get louder. As a matter of fact, it was funny. Just before service, Jonathan and I were having a conversation talking about Proverbs, I, I believe it's 26.4. Never answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. <laughs> So, no, they don't get quieter when you argue with them. As a matter of fact, what ends up happening most of the time is that you end up looking ignorant and foolish. And so, it multiplies the problem. It doesn't actually solve the problem. So, Peter says, do good so you can silence them. That means that, that we need to have good conduct and character. And you can silence the dishonor. Now, there's something that we, we know of called civil disobedience. What is civil disobedience? Civil disobedience means that like nonviolent resistance, right? And so you, you believe that there is a problem and you take it into your hands as the citizens, as a community, through nonviolent means. Meaning, I don't like what just happened, so, you know, uh, not, we're, we're not going to go out in the street and riot and burn the place to the ground. That's not what we're going to do. Instead, we may go out and have a peaceful protest in regards to what is happening. That's, that's called civil disobedience. And what it means when Peter is talking about this here is he's saying when everyone is behaving inappropriately, when everyone is doing things that they're not supposed to do, he says what we as a church are supposed to do is set a godly alternative. So when we see people behaving and misbehaving, there, there's, there's civil be, oh, disobedience done correctly and there's civil disobedience done incorrectly. And what he's saying here is as the church that, that when we are to do whatever it is we are going to do, that we do it in such a way that people look on at us and they can see the godly alternative because what does it benefit anybody if we look just like everybody? If we just look like the world when we're doing what we're doing, then, then what benefit is that to anyone? 
Then he, he goes on. The second thing he says is this. Live free, but not as a cover-up from evil. If you're, if you're saying, why you didn't put these points up? It's, it's taken directly from the scripture. Just go back and, and, and read it from verse 15. He says, live free, but not as a cover-up for evil. So he's saying this. When, when evil happens, we use it as a cover-up for more evil. Be careful of that. So it's like saying this. Evil happened to me, therefore I get to do something evil. Bad happened to me, therefore I get to do something bad. He's saying, so, so let, let's take it this way. Somebody does something to me, and, and, and as we like to say, boy, I won't set my salvation aside for five minutes just to tell you something. You stub your toe. And you don't want to understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. You, something bad happens and we use it as a justification for doing something bad. So somebody slaps you, what did Jesus say to do? Turn the other cheek, what do we do? We strike back. Something bad happened, therefore I can respond badly to it. Peter says, live free, but don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Because when we do that, when we respond with evil from evil, Peter says, that's not justice, that's injustice. The third thing he says is that we're to live as servants of God. So what he's saying here is this. Instead of using our energy for evil, he says, use your energy to serve God. Use your energy to serve God. He says, people want to serve their own agendas. People want to serve their own agendas, and because they, they want to serve their own agenda, everything that happens then gets politicized and gets twisted and pulled from the left or to the right. Think about the news for a second. I know we don't got no news stations here in Cayman, right? So, but you think about, like, let's, let's use the U.S., for example, CNN and Fox News. You can listen to the same story on both news channels and end up with two different results. CNN pulls it one way, Fox News pulls it the other way, and you're sitting there in the middle going, I'm confused. Which one is it? See, as Christians, we're not called to pull things in one direction or another. We're called to pull things up, which means that we go to God with it and we say, you know what, I, I understand what this group is saying, I understand what this one is saying, but, but, but you know what, God, I'm giving this to you, and ultimately, you are the authority that is in charge, you are the one that's in control, and because you are, I'm going to give it to you. So, so I'm not pulling it right, I'm not pulling it left, I'm pulling it up to you, Lord. I'm going to give it to Jesus, I'm going to put it at the foot of the cross. God, what do you think? God, what do you want? God, how do you want to handle this situation? How do I... And here's the question we should be asking, how do I help, meet, uh, help people meet Jesus through this? Because that's what the goal is ultimately for us as a church, right? The goal is to see people saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if this is the case, then, then, then our thought process should be, God, how do I help people meet you through this? We don't serve our own mission. We don't serve our own agenda. We we serve God. That's ultimately what the people of God are called to do. We live as servants of God. Fourth, he says, honor everyone. <laughs> Ooh. What about the people I don't like? What about the people that we know are wrong? What about the people that are very offensive and controversial? And what about the people that, that are agitating and unkind and instigators? Honor everyone. He didn't say honor most of them. He said honor who? Everyone. Everyone didn't answer with everyone, so I know everyone didn't agree with that. But at least I got a few of you this morning. Let me just say this. I, I've already said it, but let me just say it again explicitly. Honoring someone does not mean you agree with them. Honoring someone does not mean you agree with them. Let me see all the married people in the room. Hands up if you're married. You honor your spouse, but do you always agree with them? <laughs> no, you don't. At least you should honor them. 
You don't always agree with them. But in order for the relationship to be there, there needs to be mutual respect. In order for the relationship to be there, there needs to be mutual respect. And so it doesn't mean you agree. It doesn't mean you support. It does not mean that you bless. It does not mean that, that, that you fund everyone or endorse everyone. What it means is you treat them in an honorable way. And you know what? That has nothing to do with them but everything to do with you. The way you treat people has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you. Because if we can justify evil in our heart, it's because evil is in our heart. If we can justify wickedness in our heart, then it's because there is wickedness in our heart. So, so honoring people has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with us. I just need to say this for somebody this morning. I don't know who, who it is, but I'm, I'm sure somebody here needs to, to hear it. As a Christian, our goal isn't to win an argument. It's to win a person. Our goal as a Christian isn't to win an argument. It's to win a person because ultimately what matters is bringing people to Jesus. And, and, and you don't just try to win an argument for Jesus. You try to win people to to Jesus. Amen? Amen? I mean, that's what we're here to do, right? That's what the goal of the church is. To win people to Christ. That, that they might know him, that they might be saved, that they might be filled with the Holy Spirit. That, that's what it's about. Then, then the fifth thing he says is love the brotherhood. Now this is the heart of the believer. I love the scripture that says, do good for all people. Do good for everyone. But you know what the next sentence says? Or the next part of the sentence says? Especially to those who belong to the household of faith. What does that mean? As you see needs, as you want to help people, as you want to assist people, as, as you want to, to bless people and serve people and give to people, it says start first of all with the household of faith. Meaning that your family and your church family have your first obligation to those who you help, those who you bless, and those who you serve. That's not Pastor Andrew, that's the Bible. So because the Bible is telling us this, it's telling these things, what we need to do is we need to realign our priorities. We, we love the brotherhood. You know the language that people use in all, it's widespread language now. Oh, this, that's brother this and sister that. And, you know, this is my brother. This is my, that's, that's, that's Bible words. That's Bible language. When we talk about brothers and sisters in that regard, see, love the brotherhood is talking about the household of faith. We are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and this is what Peter is saying. So it's no longer about how we center our lives around a political system or how we center our lives around a political uh, party or an ideology or, or a philosophy or a government or even our race. It's about aligning ourselves around God and his word and his people. And we talked a little bit about that. Last week before the end of the message, so I won't dive too much into that today. Then he says this. He says, fear God. Now, what does that mean? That means this. It means acknowledging that God is in authority over all authority. God reigns supreme. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, meaning that he is in charge over even the, the highest authorities on the earth. And because we fear God, we recognize God as the lawgiver. Because he is the lawgiver, being God, then God has set in place laws and rules and, and things that are for all people at all times and all places. Regardless of where you are in the world, regardless of the, of the social context, regardless of, of the context of where you are politically, he says he has set certain laws in place that are to govern all people, all times, and all places. And so we've got people that are, are crying for justice, but they don't want God. They don't believe in God. And, and actually, it makes them 
hypocritical. Why I say that is this, is that you can't appeal to a law that you say doesn't exist. So if you say it doesn't exist, how can you appeal to a lawgiver that you deny then exists? And you know, it's real funny how when we have these conversations and, and people don't like the, 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 the position that we have, uh, as a Christian have taken, they don't believe in God, but they want to tell us that God is love. Why are you appealing to, to God when you don't believe in God? Isn't that a bit hypocritical? You deny it when it's convenient, but you subscribe to it when it is convenient. That's hypocritical. So... What Peter is saying here is this, is that only those who believe in God, only those who fear God, only those who, who then trust in God have a right to appeal to a higher authority, and that higher authority is God. So when there is injustice, what we as the church do is, is rather than coming along and denying all authority and trying to destroy all authority, what we do is instead we appeal to higher authority to correct the problem. So we come to God and we say, God, you are in charge. You are in control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Therefore, Lord, we come to you and we ask you to solve this issue. We ask you to resolve the problem. So whatever is wrong in the authority of the earth, the church recognizes that the ultimate authority in our lives and in the earth is who? God. Therefore, when something's wrong here, we don't depend on the government to fix our problem. We don't depend on, on this one over here or that one over there to fix the problem. We go to God and we say, God, you're the one that ultimately rules it all. So you're in charge of all of this. Think about it in this way. Imagine there's a woman who has an abusive husband. He's abusing her. He's abusing the kids. He's abusing the family. Now, what our culture, we've, we've got this cancel culture in our day and age that the minute something goes wrong, we want to cancel everything, right? So one person slips up and says something they shouldn't have said or, or we get reminded of something that somebody said from 30 years ago and, and all of a sudden it's like cancel and boycott that person. Destroy their whole life. And then what ends up happening is, is, that, is that we come along, we want to destroy the whole thing. Now, now if, if there was an abusive father, I wouldn't come along and say, you know what, we just need to cancel fatherhood. Like, like just, let's just get rid of that. Like, there, there's just no point. I mean, there, there, we've got one abusive father over here. You know, I know we've got 20 good fathers over here, but, but, but we should just cancel fatherhood. It, it wouldn't make sense to do that. What I would do in a situation like this where I'm dealing with that is that I would come and I'd appeal to a higher authority. So what I would do is I'd come to the father that's abusing his family, and bu abusing his children, abusing his, his wife, and I would instruct him on what God has said about him and about his responsibility to love, cherish, honor, and lay his life down for his family, that he's not there to, to, to beat on them. They're not beating sticks. Instead, God has given him an authority, and ultimately, God is in authority over dad, so God is the one who gets to tell dad what to do. He probably won't like that very much, but it's the reality. You're not God. So God gets to tell you what to do because he is the one in ultimate authority. We appeal to higher authority. Why? Because we fear God. We fear God. And then he ends these seven with honor the emperor. Now here's the trouble. The emperor wants to be worshipped as God. The emperor believes that Mike makes right. Because I have the iron fist, I get to tell you what to do. Because I'm stronger than you, I get to do and dominate however I want in your life, and there's nothing you can say or do. It's, it's evolutionary thought. It, it's that the, only the strong survive. I'm the strongest. You're the weakest. Therefore, I'm in charge. Well, because of this, you then need to worship me. That, that, that's, his, that's his thought. That's his way of, of thinking. But notice Peter does not say worship the emperor. What did he say? Honor the emperor. He didn't tell him to worship him. He, he said honor him. Because 
Well, worship the emperor. I can't. Well, you need to vote for the emperor. They didn't get to vote. They didn't get to decide who the emperor was going to be. Well, agree with the emperor. Well, the emperor is often wrong, so I'm not going to agree with the emperor. So he says, instead, honor the emperor. You can show respect to him. See, even if we don't, uh, even if we don't have very much respect for a person, we can still show respect to a person. Growing up, what we always hear, respect is not given, it is earned, right? And because we feel that way, but, but, but Peter says, even if you don't respect them as a person, you can, re- you can still show respect to them, you can honor them anyway. Because what you can honor about them is the fact that they are made in the image and likeness of God, just like everybody else. Every person is made in God's image and likeness and he's saying here what you need to do is appeal to this that hopefully it will be better for them that by honoring and respecting and showing respect even if you disagree with them even if you don't have very much respect for them he says you can still show honor to them there's a lot of people that we don't respect there's a lot of people that we don't have very much respect for because they don't do anything that to us is is worthy of giving them our respect but peter says regardless of that Honor them. See, in every single culture, in every single culture, there is a a pull towards, I would say, respect or rebellion. There's a pull towards respect or rebellion. And so respect is is basically almost blindly following authority. Like like they said it, we do it, we believe it, like we just we we respect everybody, right? And, and there's a strong pull towards respect in some cultures where it's just like the nation is just blinded to everything that is, that is happening. And as a result of this, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't really matter. There's, there's a lot of cultures in the world where you, you are to respect the family and regardless of the opinion of, uh, of anybody else, regardless of how wrong the family may be, you still have to respect and follow them blindly because that's what the family decided to do. That's just the culture. Doesn't matter how good or how bad it is, you just, you blindly follow the authority because the family is over you. And then, and if I'm being, and then you've got rebellion. Well, we're, I think we're pretty much all familiar with rebellion. And, and if I'm being honest with you, while I think there's some countries that lean more towards respect and some countries that lean more toward rebellion, if I'm being honest with you, I think Cayman walks a fine line in between the two. I think there's just some times where we're very passive and then there's other times where, we're, where, we, where we, we lean more towards respect and other times where we lean more towards rebellion. But I want to give us some reasons as to why cultures lean towards rebellion. Some of our cultures, and particularly even in the Cayman culture, some of the reasons why we, we lean towards rebellion. The first reason why I think we lean towards rebellion is this, is the essence of sin. The essence of sin, we believe that that everyone has sin. That since the fall happened in Genesis, that that everyone who has been born on this earth has lived in sin and has sin in their life except for Jesus. And so, but sin, the essence of sin is rooted in autonomy, meaning that that I don't need authority and pride, meaning that uh, basically I'm smarter, I should be in charge, I can do it my way, I'm, I'm, I'm better at this. The second reason why actually has to do with our faith. One of the reasons why I believe that there's an element of rebellion in in our world, and not in our world, but in in our culture and in our community, is because of our faith. There's basically three main Christian groups in the world. There's the Eastern Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Protestants. Now, Protestants basically include people like us. People, you talk, in October, we celebrate the Protestant Reformation of the church, where basically uh, we, we celebrate 
uh, the church pulling away from the Catholic church and getting back to scripture and the foundation of scripture. And, uh, and that's basically what the Reformation was about, was appealing to the higher authority. We come, come back to that. So we talk about Baptists and Pentecostals and all these groups. They are, are Protestant in their orientation. And the word Protestant comes from the root word what? Protest. So our whole faith is based on what? Protesting. Our, 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 our faith, our religion, our, the way that we, we do things came out of protesting. Because that's what the Reformation, don't get me wrong, it was a wonderful thing that happened, and I'm not saying we shouldn't protest. I'm saying that, that there's, there's an element of rebellion in that. The reason you protest is because you're rebelling against something. You can do it in a good way, you can do it in a bad way. But the Protestant Reformation was about protesting, appealing to a higher authority against the rebellion uh, of, of some of the things that they saw and the abuse that they saw happening within the church. And they wanted better. They wanted to get back to the word of God, to do things the way God said it should be done. The third reason is, is the expectation of generational rebellion. What does that mean? Expectation of generational rebellion. Meaning that, that it is expected that every generation will dishonor, disrespect, ignore, and disregard and disobey the previous generation. So let me put it this way. We expect that our children will dishonor, disobey, disregard their parents. So... There is this expectation that every generation, the next generation will be more rebellious or rebel against the previous generation. So let me put it this way in terms that, that we understand. How many times have we heard in recent times, well, if this generation don't want to do it, the next generation that's coming along will do it. Why? Because the expectation is the rebellion of the next generation against the previous one. Fourth one. Now, this comes back a little bit more towards respect. I'm, I'm talking specifically about how came on teeters and totters this line. So we're, we're, we're considered a British overseas territory, right, which means that we are still under the rule of the U.K. And I think that that has been very clear to us in the last couple of weeks. But U.K. government decides something. We get upset about it, or even our own government decides something. We get upset about it. We don't like it. We make it known. But then we say we can't do anything about it, so let's just accept it. That's respect. We almost blindly follow what's happening, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should go out in the streets and riot and burn places to the ground. That's not what Andrew's saying. So if you walk away from here saying that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about how we teeter this line between respect and rebellion. Fifth, that we have to understand that every organization and institution is not perfect and has sin in it. Every institution. So what do we do since every institution has rebellion and sin in it? Do we burn it to the ground? Do we dismantle it? Or do we improve it? Well, I'd say we improve it. Now, that would be my first thought. Let me give you an example, right? Some human institutions. And these are probably more clear in places like, like the United States and the UK and places like that. But, but it's probably one of the, 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 the clearest examples that we have of this. So we've got police officers and teachers, right? And, and both of them are, are most police officers want to respect the rule of law. Most police officers want to protect citizens. Most police officers are, are, are there because they want to bless, protect, and serve the communities that they live in. Most teachers want to bless, protect, and serve the communities that they live in. But every once in a while, you got an officer on the news who has abused their authority and has used excessive force. Every once in a while... We got a teacher on the news who has abused their authority and groomed a child for molestation and, 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 uh, and, and sexual abuse. So do, in that case, do we come along and we say, well, we've got bad teachers and we've got bad police officers, so dismantle the police. Dismantle our teachers. 
No, because we need police to protect and serve. And for the most part, most police officers are great. On the other hand, we've got teachers. We, we, need, we still need an education, right? So what do we do? We improve those institutions rather than trying to dismantle them. We appeal to a higher authority rather than trying to simply get rid of and cancel education or law. This is what Peter is trying to talk about. When Peter says be sober-minded, he's saying when everybody's emotional, when everybody's freaking out, when, when everybody's mentally drunk, you are to be sober. You're to think clearly. You're to think through the issue. You're to think through the problems because otherwise you're going to respond emotionally and then you're going to become foolish and ignorant. And that doesn't serve anybody. I mean, just think about it. You go to, you go to somewhere, you don't get the service you want or, or something happens and, and, and you, you're upset about it. And what you say, they don't want me to get ignorant. Why? Because they, they, you know. You know. My father, the, the, the Lord has such a sense of humor. I went somewhere this week and I, I got real frustrated. And the first thought that popped into my mind was, these people don't want me to get ignorant up in here today. And, and I stopped and I thought about it for a second and I went, what's wrong with you? For what? Just be patient for a few minutes now. Because you, then, you know, it would it, be all over the place. Psh, boy, and he a pastor? Look how he went on up in there. Talking about he loved the Lord. Man. So that's what I think we're facing. That, that, that's what I think right now is the culture, the climate that we're, we're dealing with. Today. I know some of this is heavy, but we got to get through it. So I, I, I'll come back to some of this in, in just a little bit, but but here's what I think we're facing ultimately. Ecclesiastes says that God has set eternity in the heart of man. And we've touched on this just a little bit. But what it means when it says that is that within every human being is a desire, is a longing, it, it, it is, is this, this, there's something in us. We, we want heaven. We want eternity. We, we want those things. We want and we long for a utopia because something in this world just doesn't feel or seem right, does it? There's just a lot of messed up things happening in this world and it does not feel like, oh. And Peter is saying, what you've got to realize, what you've got to remember, what you've got to recognize is that this world is messed up. And because of it, we feel like human flourishing is being limited. Because of it, we, we feel like, like we, we, we need to do more. And because we can say this, you, you hear the like, biblical terms in there, right? We might say it a little different. But, but we have a sense of heaven. We have a sense of the fall. We have this sense of, of, of urgency to, to want life and, and for life to be great and beautiful and wonderful. And Peter's saying as we recognize these things, that ultimately what has happened in humanity is that the ultimate pursuit of our heart has become how do we create heaven now? How do we create it without God? We talked about how, how they wanted to make Zion last week, right? How do we make heaven on earth? Well, let me tell you how we do that. We take biblical concepts, we twist them, and we turn them into something that is unbiblical. But because they have a modicum of the truth in them, we accept them. In, in, in 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, it tells us that they will reject the truth and that they will wander into myths because, well, that's what they want to do. Hey, I, I, I listened to a guy the other day. Somebody sent me something on Facebook, and, and, and I listened to a guy, well-known guy, and uh, has a huge, massive following of millions of people. And here he is. He says, you know why I love the Bible? You can justify anything from it. And I'm going, Huh? You can justify anything. I said, let me hear this. He said, man, he says, if you want to cut somebody's head off, you can just, I said, let me find my Bible. 
So if you want, whatever it is you want to do, however good or bad, if you want to be completely evil and wicked, go ahead and do it. The Bible will justify it. I'm going, we must be reading two different books. My Bible? Huh? I was confused. See, the Bible tells us that that we will take truth. If you want a teacher for anything, I can find you a teacher for anything, and we can take just a little bit of the Bible, and all you need is just a little bit. A little bit of leaven spoils the whole thing. That's all it takes. So what we've done is, is as a, as a nation, as a community, and even, yes, here in Cayman, we've become almost atheistic in our approach to life. So we say, we're going to adopt ideas, we're going to adopt ideologies, we're going to adopt philosophies on how to make heaven on earth. How can we bring it here? How can we make it here? How can we do it here? We don't have God, it's just us. Remember last week I started telling you that part of the problem we're dealing with in our day and age in this postmodern era, in this post-Christian era, is the deification of humanity? Meaning that what we're trying to basically say is that we are God, so we get to determine what is right and what is wrong. That's what we're dealing with. This is where, where countries all over the world, not just came on. We used to be the island that time forgot, not anymore. We are dealing with the deification of our humanity, meaning that, that we are in process of trying to make heaven on earth so that we can be God without God. And we don't have heaven, so we need to make it now. And what he's trying to get us to see here, what Peter's trying to say here, is, is, is that we need to understand that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. So Peter gets into something that's real controversial in our day and age. Starts talking about slaves and slave masters. And I think this is important to talk about, uh, you know, because first of all, one of the things I've learned as being a Christian is that most Christians don't spend a lot of time reading their Bible. Or I shouldn't say it that way. Most Christians don't spend a lot of time studying their Bible. They will read through it, but they, they'll, they'll finish it and they'll go, but that made no sense. And they pick out certain things about it, and then they go, well, the Bible justifying slavery over here. Well, the Bible's saying this over here and not over there, and we start pulling all these things out, and we start going, we're going, that's messed up, but we don't have any understanding. I think it's important that we understand, because particularly for one of the reasons why it, it's historically known that the Bible was used to justify slavery. Right? That's one of the reasons why people go, I mean, let's be honest, we live in Cayman, and if you take just a quick survey of the room, the majority of the people in this room are not white people. Majority of the people in this room are, are from other, uh, other national, nationalities and races. We've got, we've got Hispanics, we've got Filipinos, we, we've got all kinds of people from all over the world. That's just life in Cayman, Right? And so when we talk about this, and we're talking about this idea of slaves and slave masters, and we're looking at it and we're going, but, you know, I've, had, I've actually had people say this. Why do black people go to your church? What do you mean? Well, the Bible was used to enslave them. Why do they even bother to listen to it at all? The Bible was used to take away their rights, to say that they were less than, to put them in chains. And it wasn't just a question directed specifically towards me, it was just a question directed towards church in general, because the person that I was speaking to, their, their thought process was that no black person should ever read the Bible, no black person should ever, ever want to know anything about Jesus Christ and God, because that's the white man's God. Let me just say something about the white man's God. Jesus wasn't white. He wasn't white. And if he was white, I've been to Israel. The 
only white people you really see in Israel are the Taurus. Majority of them are, are olive or dark brown. So this idea that, that somehow God would, yeah. So let me, let, me, let me bring it back here even to some of the stuff we're dealing with. So here we've got this new bill that's trying to be passed in the government, right? And, and it fails. The governor comes along and the governor says, well, he's been instructed to institute it and so forth. And so uh, and now we're going to have, as I understand it, he's changed the name now from the domestic partnership bill to civil unions. Civil partnerships, whatever it is, he's changed it to. Same girl, different dress. And so the church comes and says, the church says, well, no, we don't, we don't agree with that. We don't think we should do so. Why? Because we believe that there's an ultimate authority, and that ultimate authority is who? God. Which means that we take the Bible, we order, and we orient our lives around it. And there's a lot of things that have happened and say, well, why is this the only issue? This isn't the only issue. But we've, we've come and we've said, well, we don't agree with this. Well, that's because you're a homophobe. I'm not a homophobe. What are you talking about? Well, because now the, the governor has, has followed instruction from the UK to impose it on us, well, if you just go along and agree with him, then you've got other people on the other side now that are going and saying, well, well you, you just like imperial and colonial, colonialistic rule. So you want colonial imposition or you're a homophobe. Those are your two options. How many of you think that's a great idea? I mean, I, 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 I've got two options in life. I can be homophobic or I can be a colonialist. And neither of those two options really sound great to us, do they? Because we're going, that's, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying we're homophobic. We're not, we're not saying that we want to, to somehow kill or destroy people's lives even though they, that we disagree with the way that they live. That's not what we're saying. We're, we're not over here saying that, that, hey, we shouldn't have any say in what happens in our own, in our own uh, government, in our own island, in, in our own laws about what's going on. We're not saying that. We want to, we're saying that, that what we ultimately want to order our lives around is what? Jesus, the word of God. And because he said certain things, we want to follow those things. Now, what's interesting about this is that they say, well, you don't believe in equality and human flourishing. Well, do you know where the idea of human rights, equality, and human flourishing came from? The Bible. I just finished telling you about what historically it was like in the Roman Empire. Matter of fact, we're going to get into some more of that. But before I do, I want to give you a few quick things about God's path to equality. See, God has a path for equality for us. Let me share a little bit about that with you. The first thing in God's path to equality is this, is that all humans, all people are created by God as full image bearers. Which means regardless of whether you are a Christian or not, regardless if you are an atheist or not, you have been made in the image and likeness of God. You are an image bearer of God. Second thing is that there is one race made up of all nations and cultures descended from Adam and Eve. Which means what? That yeah, I know we all got different parents, but if, we, if you take your family line and you go back far enough in your historical line, that eventually you will discover that all of us came from the same two people. You know, I love how science is catching up with the Bible. Just recently, I was reading something about how that science agrees that we all have the same matriarchal mother. So we all technically came from the same woman. So I wonder what about the father? Anyway, that's a story for another time. So... Ultimately, yeah, we may, we may be white, black, we may be uh, brown, we may be Caymanian, we may be Jamaican, we, we may be American, we may be Filipino, we could be from wherever it is we are from. But ultimately, we are all one race, one people that have all come from the same parents, Adam and Eve. Third, every person is a sinner and every system is affected by human sin. This is important to understand because what it allows us to understand is the equality that we are all sinners. We all need Jesus. We have all been affected by sin. 
Fourth, God establishes laws to provide equality for all people. So the laws of God were established to do what? Create equality. You know, God is going to judge each of us by the same law. He doesn't have a, 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 a certain law for sinners and a certain law for Christians and a certain law for Muslims and a certain law for, for homosexuals and a certain law for this one or that. No, same law for everybody. We will all be judged according to the same law. As a matter of fact, as much as I love hearing people say this, it's just not true. You can't legislate morality except like a good portion of the laws around the world have been actually hijacked from the Bible. So if it was good enough then, explain to me why you're not good enough now. Fifth, God's kingdom is the pattern for justice and social order for those under God's authority. So let's for, let's for instance talk about this. Children, obey your parents. But what else does it say? Fathers, don't exacerbate your children. Don't Grieve your children. Husbands, love your wives. Isn't that what it says? We're going to get more into that as we move through First Peter because we come into that part. Not today, but. So, he, so, so, so God's saying, hey, there's something for everybody. Six, God people, God's people are a new family called the chosen race and a new man. So what it's saying here is this, is that when we, when we get called by God, when we become a Christian, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, we become a part of a new family, a chosen race. We become new people in Christ. Seven, leadership in the church is based upon character, not social, uh, social factors. So when you read the book of Philemon or Philemon or Philemon or however you pronounce it, I've heard so many different versions of it. Give me a Philemon, whatever. When you read it, in it there is a pastor by the name of Onesimus. I believe is how you say his name. You know who he was? A slave. A pastor who was a slave. And when he goes back to his slave master, when you, when you read the, the, the book of Philemon, what you see there is where he says, don't treat him as a slave. What does he say? Treat him as a brother. So we have this guy who is a slave who is being told, his slave master is being told, he's the pastor in your house. Treat him like a brother, not as a slave. And guess what? This same brother is the same brother who delivered the book of Philemon as well as he helped to deliver the book of Colossians. Two incredible and important books by Paul that were written. And here we've got this brother who, who's a slave. And Paul's saying, hey. You see, in our world, it says, well, he's a slave. He can't be that. Based on social factors. He's got to be somebody. He's got to do something. But, but, but in God's world, God says, it, it, your social status is not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at your character. I'm looking at who you are. I'm looking at the heart. So leadership in the church is not based upon social factors. Number eight, Christianity has been and has the most diversity of any movement in history. If you're into diversity, you should be into Jesus. We've crossed more cultures, more borders, more people than, than, than any other institution, any other movement that I am aware of. Historically, the church, I mean, just think about the church. I mean, we've got people just in our church, just look at our church, people from all different countries. You go around the world, you, you got people hiding in, in certain countries and they're Christians. You know, you got Christians in, in, in Iraq, in China. That they may be underground, but they're still Christians. You know, when we talk about, about slavery in the church, you know, St. Patrick, please don't drink beer to celebrate St. Patrick. He was not about that. He was a Christian. And you know what? He was a slave. A slave 
who fought to end slavery by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rodney Stark, a historian, he said, slavery ended in Europe only because the church extended its sacraments to all slaves and then managed to impose a ban on enslavement of Christians and Jews. So it was the church who helped to get rid of slavery. William Wilberforce, who opposed it in Great Britain. Two-thirds, and I said this already, but two-thirds of American abolitionists were Christians motivated by biblical Christian principles, meaning that two-thirds of the people who fought to abolish slavery in America were people who loved the Lord and said, this isn't right. Rosa Parks, Christian. Jackie Robinson, Christian. Martin Luther King, Christian. I know none of those are Cayman heroes, but they're the ones I'm familiar with. Right? They were all Christians who loved the Lord, and that motivated them in their walk with God. See, we've got to understand that sometimes history has not been told to us correctly. In 1 Peter chapter 2, let's keep reading, 18 to 21. So he says, servants, be subject to your masters, and we'll come back to this, with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. You know, the Bible acknowledges that there is injustice. The Bible acknowledges that fact. It said, for this is a gracious thing, when, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it? If when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, now again, let's pause here. Let me just, uh, can, 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 uh, if you're taking notes or you're doing whatever, just, just pause for a second. Look at me. This is going to be hard for you to hear. But a part of your Christian ministry is to suffer. Welcome to Agape. We're not in heaven yet. This isn't heaven. And a part of your Christian ministry is to suffer. And I know we don't like that. But I'll be honest with you. Any pastor who doesn't prepare their people for suffering is not doing their job. Jesus said, in this world, you will have Tribulation, you will have trouble. There will be suffering. If he endured suffering, why do we think we'll escape it? But I'm thankful that God says that he'll be with us through the valley of the shadow of death. That he, sometimes we just have to walk through it. There's just going to be some bad days, people. Last verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. See, can I be honest with you? We live in a country that does not fully accept and will not represent our values fully. It's just a reality. I know what our Constitution says. I, I know what everybody gets up and likes to say and, 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 and how people like to do certain things. And, I, and I'm not saying that, that there's not an element of genuineness in what people are doing and what people are saying. I'm saying that we have to remember that we live in a place that will not fully represent and accept our values according to the word of God. It's just a reality, and I'm, and, and I'm sorry if that's a shock to you. I'm actually not sorry, but if that's a shock to you, it shouldn't be. Because I know, yes, I know what our Constitution says, but, but as a result of, of living out our faith here, there is just going to be some things that Peter is saying you're not going to be able to do. You're just not going to be able to do them. There, there's just going to be certain things you, you're not going to be able to believe. There's just going to be certain things you're not going to be able to, to participate in. There's just going to be certain things you can't agree with and that you cannot do as you live out your faith in certain ways you cannot behave because you base your life on the word of God. And even though it may be legal, it doesn't mean that it is not sinful. There's a lot of things that are legal that are still sinful. And there's going to be a lot of pressure that's going to be put on you publicly. 
There's going to be a lot of pressure that's going to be put on you, possibly even legally, possibly even physically, possibly even financially or personally. And as a result, the reality of it is, is that you will suffer unjustly. And it will be wrong what is said about you and what is done to you as a result of it. But Peter says, this is a gracious thing for you. He's saying God has hidden a means of grace for you in the midst of your suffering. You know, one of the interesting things when you look at the martyrs is that oftentimes the martyrs have historically somehow verbalized and vocalized even in their their suffering, even in their death, even when they're being beaten and wounded and, and going through incredible hardship, have still been able to vocalize and verbalize the graciousness of God sustaining them through some of the most horrific things that have ever happened to people. That God brought them through those things. See, let me give you some things about suffering. Suffering makes us grateful for Jesus. Suffering makes us grateful for Jesus. He, he left heaven to enter into suffering on, for our sake. And because he did so, he, he did it for us. Unjust suffering allows us to be comforted by Jesus. So not only does it make us grateful for him, it, makes us, it allows us to be comforted by him. The Bible says that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us. He knows what it's like to go through suffering. He knows what it's like to, to feel and, and to hurt the way that you are. And, and as a matter of fact, later on, Peter's going to talk about how the more we suffer, the more of God's grace we have in our lives. We're going to come to that later on. But the more suffering you experience, it's important to know the more of God's grace you need. Suffering also makes us like Jesus. When we go through suffering, the question we should ask is, how can I be more like Jesus in this? How can I be more like Jesus? How can I respond like Jesus would? What would Jesus do? Because the goal is to respond like Jesus so we can become like Jesus, so we can respond like Jesus. And the reason is because we are God's servants who've been commissioned to serve his kingdom. See, the whole context of 1 Peter is a servant, a bond servant, a slave, right? And that may may spark some questions in your mind. So we'd come back to this idea of being a servant, being subject to their masters. Particularly because when we think about slavery, we think about the, the, the American, Latin American, Caribbean version of slavery, right? And uh, I, I was doing some research on this and, and uh, I found something from uh, a, a, a brother in Christ where he talked about three kinds of servants that the Bible talks about. And I'll, I'll get into those in just a second because the question was, what does the Bible mean when it says servants? Well, to give you some context and idea of this, at the time of the writing of this in the Roman Empire, approximately 50% of the Roman Empire were were slaves. Approximately 50% of the Roman Empire were servants. Now, at the time of the Civil War in America, and the Civil War was, remember, the the Confederate states pulled away, and uh, the whole reason they wanted to to, to fight and why they had that fight, I mean, the brutal war, was because they were fighting over slavery, the terms of slavery, about continuing to be able to have slaves. That's why they fought over that. That's what the Civil War was about. Well, to give you some context at the time, still wrong, But only about 10% of Americans would have been slaves in comparison to what Peter is writing about where 50% of the nation, huge sprawling nation, bigger than America, would have been slaves. So the people that Peter is talking to and writing to and talking about this, I mean, this is everywhere for them. Like I said, still wrong. Don't make it right. But just to give you the context of, of what, we are used to versus what is happening in the book of 1 Peter. So the first uh, uh, servant or, or slavery the Bible talks about is this, slave trading, and it is wrong. This is what we would be most familiar with being here in the Caribbean, right? I'll give you this example. 1 Peter chapter 1, 9 to 11. 
And it says this, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral, for those who practice homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for what else is contrary to sound doctrine or healthy doctrine, that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of God, of the blessed God, the, which is he entrusted to me. So he's saying here, he says it clear as day, slavery is bad. Slave trading is bad, All right? And we've seen, uh, we, we look at that whole list, right? We've seen outrage at some of these things, but not all of these things. Like sexual immorality, for instance. What does that mean? No living together before you get married. No sex before you get married. Remaining pure and not, not sleeping around and going all over the place. I don't see anybody throwing a no fornication parade. The outrage is not there for everything. And, and, and what, what the Bible is saying to us is this, is that, is that if we are going to go by God's law, God says all these things are wrong. God doesn't just pick out one and say, oh, well, that one's bad. That one's real bad. God says, no, all these things are subject to the law of God and the judgment of God, and it's not about some of these, it's about all these. So when we endorse one of these and not the other one, here's what we do. We lose the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we say, hey, you know what? I think slave trading is pretty horrible. But you know what? Sexual morality, I don't mind that too much. Why not try it before you buy it? Since that's the one everybody likes to use so much. God says, that's not good. That's not right. Because you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is about repentance of sin. And for the church, that's one of the hallmarks of our faith, is that, is that we would live a life of repentance. And culture is all about the tolerance of sin, but God says, you tolerate things I refuse to tolerate. As a matter of fact, when we did the series on the seven churches of Revelation and we looked at that in the seven letters, God says that to one of the churches. He says, you tolerate things that I don't. If we think God doesn't care, well, we're sorely mistaken. That's New Testament, not any Old Testament, by the way. Because see, if we don't preach repentance, then we're not preaching the gospel. And they'll say, well, we want to love people. Well, so do we. We want to alleviate people's suffering. So do I. Which is why I preach the gospel, because eternal suffering is the worst suffering of all. And so Peter here, he's saying slave trading. Like I said, in, in America, in the Caribbean, in, in Latin America, we're, we're, we're motivated when we read this idea of slavery because we're motivated by something that was almost predominantly racial. But in Rome, almost every culture... Every, it didn't matter what culture you were from, almost every single culture practiced this, and almost every single culture within the Roman Empire were slaves. In the Caribbean, it was mostly racial, but in the Roman Empire, it wasn't. It was not motivated mostly by slavery. You, you, you didn't have human rights, you, you were considered property, and there were even people who were born into slavery. The Bible says it's sin good example of this would have been Joseph. Everybody knows Joseph in the coat of many colors. Well, his family sold him into slavery. Yes, he ended up becoming one of the most prominent people in the land, but his people, the Israelites, when we read the book of Exodus, what do we see happen? They became slaves. That's because slave trading. Second way is that, that the people often became prisoners, uh, sorry, not prisoners, slaves, were by being prisoners of war. So, for instance, and, and even uh, what we would see happen historically, country comes in, destroys another country, takes the people as slaves. Daniel, Daniel was a slave. He was a prisoner of war in Babylon. And as a matter of fact, historically, most people who've been slaves in history have been slaves because of being prisoners of war. We came into your country, we destroyed your country, now you're a slave. The third way is a bond servant. Now, let's read this one. Paul talks about this, 1 Corinthians 7, 20 to 23, and he says, 
Each one should remain in the condition which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Now, let me pause here for a second. What are you saying? If you're married before you became a Christian and you become a Christian, love your husband. If you're, or, or, or your wife, if you got kids and you become a Christian, love your kids. Don't just say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm out of there now. If you're a bond servant, he says, get free if you can. But if you can't, continue to honor. Now, here's the thing about being a bond servant. Well, let me finish reading, then we'll come back to that. For he was called in the Lord, for he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freed man of the Lord. So if you were a slave, if you were a bond servant, then you, when you become a Christian, you're, you're, he says you're free. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Now, bond servanthood was not mainly racial. What bond servants were, were people who, within the context of the day and age, what happened was is that they would oftentimes have issues that they would basically sell themselves to someone to work for them so that they could pay off debt. So let's say the economy cl collapsed. Things aren't going so hot, things aren't going so well, and you need food, you need shelter for your family, you lost everything. What you would do is you would become a bond servant to someone, and their family would protect you, they would give you shelter, they would give you food, they would look over you, uh, basically, and uh, that was kind of bond servanthood. So you went into it almost sort of willingly. Maybe pressure forced you to go into it, but it wasn't like you, because you were black or because you were white or because you were Asian or whatever, that you, that you ended up being forced into this. It was just, as a matter of fact, an element of this still exists today. So for instance, if you get a student loan, like for instance, I had a bond servant agreement with uh, one of the student loans that I had, which said that in order to pay back my loan, I had to come back and live in Cayman and work in Cayman for at least five years after I graduated college. That was a bond servant agreement. They didn't pay me for it, but, but if I didn't obey it, if I didn't follow it, then I could have gotten in trouble. So even to this day, bond servant agreements actually still exist. And so this is one of the things that, that still exists even today in our world. These agreements, these, we call them bonds, right? And, and you know, you're bonded to this. It's the same kind of concept. But people who read the Bible, critics of the Bible, will come along and say, well, this is, makes the Bible racist. It means that the Bible is, is saying that you should be a slave. 50% of the Roman Empire was slaves, and the Bible would say that it's evil. We just read that, that it is evil. But what Peter and Paul are all trying to say here when they're talking about bond servanthood is this, is that just because you met Jesus doesn't mean you don't have to pay back your student loan. That's basically what it's the equivalent of. Bond servanthood, again, it's, it's tough to, to read into that context and not understand it, but when we bring it into a modern context, they say, well, can you imagine you came to church and you got saved and that means your student loan was paid off immediately? Or like, I don't have to pay it back because I know Jesus now? Like that makes no sense to any of us, and that's what he's saying here. So it's very different when you talk about you have to kind of understand the context of it here. So the Bible does say that slavery is evil. The Bible does say that it's wrong. The Bible says you shouldn't do it. But what does the Bible say? We were talking about civil disobedience earlier. What does the Bible say about it? Because when we talk about this, it sounds like, hey, you're trying to say, well, we shouldn't do anything about anything. Well, what the Bible says is this about authority. It says we should submit to authority unless, one, it forbids us from doing what God commands. Or, two, it commands us to do what God forbids. So we follow the government, we listen to the rules, we, we, we obey as long as it doesn't forbid us from doing what God commands us to do and as long as it com as doesn't command us to do what God forbids. So in China, they've got population control and they say, hey, you, you, you got to kill your kid, we've got population control. I can't. I don't believe in that. You should worship the emperor. I can't. I worship Jesus. Reading the Bible is illegal. Well, what the church do when, it, when it's illegal? We smuggle it in. 
See, in the kingdom of God, there was order, there was harmony, but in the kingdom of the devil, there is disorder and anarchy. And the solution for bad governance is not no governance. It's appealing to God to fix the broken system that exists. Civil disobedience is the opposite of anarchy when we do it correctly because anarchy is to destroy the rule of law. Civil disobedience is appealing to God's law. I know we're going long, but just stick with me. We're almost done. This is important because if I don't talk about all this, you'll walk around and say, Pastor Andrew's racist. So in the Old Testament, here's how some examples of civil disobedience. We had some midwives in Egypt who were told, hey, any Jewish babies that are born, you kill them. And they went, that's infanticide and racist, and we're not going to do it. So we ended up with somebody like Moses, right? Daniel, Daniel's told, hey, you should eat the king's food. Daniel said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing it because it's a counterfeit communion. I'm not, I'm not participating in that. His friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is what we know them as, but that, that's not their original names. So bow to the statue and worship the emperor. What did they do? They said, no, we're going to stick out like a sore thumb and we're going to stand on our own two feet because we worship the Lord our God and him only. Nobody else. Daniel, again, you're not allowed to pray. Stop praying. So what does Daniel do? He goes in his house, he opens the windows, and he starts praying. Civil disobedience done correctly. In the New Testament, Paul wrote Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon from where? prison. Why was he in prison? For talking to people about Jesus. And even when he went there, he didn't stop talking to people about Jesus. Now, now Peter, here, let me give you a, a, a good example of bad civil disobedience. When they came to arrest Jesus, what did, they, what did Peter do? He cut a guy's ear off. What did Jesus do? He rebuked him. And then he stuck the guy's ear back on and, and healed him, and then the guy could hear again, right? So, that's Peter doing it wrong. But here's Peter doing it right. When you get to Acts chapter 5, and, and the government says, hey, no preaching about Jesus. So what do they do? They, they go preach about Jesus. And then they get taken up by the government, arrested, put in prison. And what happens next? An angel shows up and releases them from prison, and then they, they escape from prison. They, they escape from the prison to go back to the temple to do what? Preach about Jesus. So they get called back in again. Hey, guys, listen, we've already arrested you once for this. You escaped somehow, and you went back to talking about Jesus again. You need to stop this. And they, their response was, we obey God, not you. We honor your authority, but ultimately we honor God's authority. And then they were beaten, they were released, and then they went back to preaching about Jesus. And the Bible says that they were rejoicing because they were associated with Jesus. See, our goal as Christians is not to live a comfortable life. Our goal as Christians is to live a life like Christ. But this is the Western Christian's problem. Is how do I live like Christ and be comfortable? So the last block of scripture we're going to read here and then close tells us that Jesus is the victim of your sinful injustice. If we feel like we've been mistreated, if we feel like we should have more, if we feel like we should deserve, that we deserve better, the moment that we do that, what we've done is that we've taken ourselves and made ourselves the story of the Bible and made ourselves Jesus. We're saying that we are righteous and that we are a victim and so Peter shifts our focus and he says the word of God is not to be binoculars for us to, to look at everything that everyone has done wrong but to be a mirror to see what we've done wrong. And so he says in 1 Peter 2, 22 to 25, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. What does that mean? That Jesus was the biggest victim in the world. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to he who judges justly. Jesus didn't get on Facebook and rant and talk about how unjustly 
everything that happened to him was. He didn't start a blog. He didn't complain. He didn't revile. He didn't cuss him out. He didn't say, I set my salvation aside for five minutes to tell you about yourself. He dealt with unjust authority by appealing to ultimate authority. It says in verse 24 that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. See, to be a Christian... We need to consider not just what others did to us, but what we have done to Jesus. Then see how Jesus responded to us, and then respond like he did. He himself bore our sins on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, meaning you are healed. You don't need to act like everybody else. You ain't drunk-minded anymore. You're sober-minded now. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We're all sheep, but there's a good shepherd who keeps the sheep near him. And he keeps them from harm. And you're going to need to stay really close to the good shepherd. You're going to need to stay really close to him and listen really close to him. Because I can tell you, non-Christians can diagnose a problem, but Jesus is the only solution. And if we allow the brokenness of the world to break the church, then the world has no answer. Because Jesus is the only answer. Let's pray. Lord, I know we've talked about some difficult things here today. I I know, Lord, that that for many of us as we, as we consider these issues and these topics, and I just ask right now for your grace and your mercy to flood us. Father God, we know that we're, we're dealing with, with, with a lot of controversial things in our day and age, but I thank you, God, that you love every single one of us. I thank you, Lord, that you have chosen from among the nations of this world your children. That, Father God, that we would be a chosen people from every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. God, I thank you. You are not a racist. I thank you that that, that you didn't call us to be slaves. I thank you, Father God, that you instead made us free in you. And even right now as a nation, as we navigate some difficult waters and some difficult times, as, as we consider all the things that's going on and what our response should be and what our response shouldn't be, Father God, I pray first and foremost that we would always appeal to you with what we do. And so, Lord, when we, when we make demonstrations, when we do things, when we act in civil disobedience, and that's okay that we do that, but that, Lord, that we would honor you with everything that we do. God, help us. I know, Lord, sometimes it's hard, but help us to honor the emperor, to honor the governors, to honor the human institutions, Lord, that that, that you have put here. Even when we disagree with them, even when we know they are wrong, even when we know they represent the wrong thing, that, Father God, you would first check our hearts. Because, Lord, if we believe that we can do evil and justify it, then, Lord, then we really have missed your heart. And ultimately, God, you've called us. you called us to have new hearts, to have clean hands and pure hearts. So, Lord, today, may that be the case. Lord, we, we just come humbly right now. And we pray for our nation that is facing all these things. And we just ask, God, for your leadership and your guidance. We appeal to you today as the ultimate authority. And we just ask for you to have your way, God. We surrender our lives. We surrender our church. We surrender our nation to you today, God. And we just ask you, would you, Lord, reign and rule supreme over all things? Because, Father God, while we know there's a lot of things in this world that we disagree with, we know there's a lot of things that shouldn't happen. We know there's a lot of things that, Father God, are not of you. I pray what you would help us as the church to be is a light in this world. To Father God, continue to let the hope of Jesus, the healing of Jesus, the heart of Jesus shine through because Jesus, you are the answer to fixing all of the problems in this world. And Lord, while we know we are anxious for your return, while we're waiting, help us to be busy in loving 
of sharing your message with the entire world. Change our hearts, oh God. Change our hearts today that we might love you and serve you. That we might live for you more than we ever have before. So fill us today with your Holy Spirit and have your way in our lives because you are the answer to all our brokenness. Amen. Listen, I, I know time is gone and I, I know everybody, you know, you better probably hungry and all that kind of stuff today. But it's important that we talk about these things. It's important that we get through them because I believe with all my heart today that God wants to do some incredible things through the church. And it's important that we understand what God's word says and who God's called us to be that we might live for him. And the greatest thing that you can do in leaving here today is go and live a life of Christ before this world that they may see the hope and the light of him in you. That's the greatest thing you could do right now. If you want to see people's lives change, if we want to see our nation change, if we want to see God working and moving, then, then that's how it happens. It starts with us living for Jesus. And when we do that, that's what changed the Roman Empire. That's what changed the world. And that's what will change the world again. So let's live for Jesus and not underestimate the power that comes with doing that. I love you and God bless you. Let's live for him who is our only hope.